Harry Potter is a cultural phenomenon that was born from the quill of Joanne Rowling, a British writer who first came up with the idea of the book while waiting for a train to London that had a four-hour delay. She says the idea of a boy who attends a school of magic came to her mind fully formed, so when she finally got to her apartment, she started writing immediately. It was 1990. The early death of her mother that very same year had a strong influence over the character's creation. Harry and Rowling shared the same feeling of grief and orphanhood. Seven years, a daughter and a divorce later, J.K. Rowling finally managed to get Bloomsbury Publishing House to publish Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. At the end of that very same year, a copy of the novel reached Heyday Films, David Heyman's production company. Heyman was an art historian who graduated from Harvard. He had just founded a company aimed at adapting books into films and wanted his first project to be the adaptation of a kid's novel. His first attempt had failed, so his secretary tried to convince him to give Harry Potter a chance. Heyman didn't like the book at first because he thought the title was terrible, but her secretary took the novel home for the weekend and fell in love with it. Heyman gave it another chance and loved it too, so he decided to buy the rights. However, his small production company didn't have the necessary budget for such a huge film, so he made an agreement with Warner Brothers. Heyday would be in charge of discussing things with the author, such as the details of the rights, and Warner would provide funding and the artistic direction. While negotiations moved forward little by little, Harry Potter was becoming an unstoppable phenomenon. The book was first released in the United Kingdom, and the next year in the US. Then came the second book. In 1999, while the third book was being printed and sales skyrocketed worldwide, Warner Brothers made Rowling an offer. They would buy the adaptation rights for the first four books for a million pounds. That is, a bit over a million dollars. Rowling agreed under one condition. Since Harry Potter was set in England, the cast should be all British. This requirement was the cause of the first disagreement with Warner Brothers, since they originally wanted to make an animated film. Warner was afraid the cast would grow too much if for any reason the production was delayed. Steven Spielberg, one of the first directors considered for the job, was very keen on the animated project and wanted Haley Joel Osment from The Sixth Sense to be the voice of Harry. Another solution the studio came up with was to make one film combining several of the books. None of those options convinced Rowling, so they agreed on shooting the films one after the other, trying to keep the time between them as short as possible. In the meantime, Spielberg decided to focus on artificial intelligence and left the project. With the legendary director out of the table, several other names were considered. The final group of possible directors were Terry Gilman, director of Brazil and Twelve Monkeys, Alan Parker, who made Evita and Pink Floyd The Wall, and Chris Columbus, the mind behind Home Alone and Mrs. Doubtfire. Rowling really wanted Gilliam, but Warner feared the end result wouldn't be suitable for all audiences, and ended up going for Columbus, who had more experience working with young actors and actresses. Stephen Clovis was chosen as the screenwriter. His experience adapting books led to Warner sending him a list of novels the company wanted to adapt. Clovis loved the challenge and accepted, even though he had never worked on such a demanding project. The pressure of the media and the relationship with the author scared him, but luckily for both of them, their first meeting went fine. Rowling was skeptical at first, but her doubts were dispelled when he told her his favorite character was Hermione. They agreed that Rowling would have a veto power over the final script and that every change should be discussed with her first. Susie Figgis, the cast director, immediately got to work helped by Columbus and Rowling. The author had specifically requested two people, Robbie Coltrane to play Hagrid and Maggie Smith to play McGonagall. The latter had curiously already worked with Daniel Radcliffe once in a BBC television adaptation of the novel David Copperfield. Richard Harris was offered the part of Dumbledore, but he turned it down at first because of his delicate health. After such a long career, he didn't want to be remembered only for his last role, but in the end, he took the part because his 11-year-old granddaughter threatened to never speak to him again if he didn't. American actors Robin Williams and Rosie O'Donnell tried getting Hagrid's and Molly Weasley's parts respectively, even if they were not paid at all, but the studio refused because of their nationality. Alan Rickman wasn't sure about playing Snape because he was tired of always acting as a villain and only accepted the role after he knew that the despised professor had actually some hidden motives for his actions. Tim Roth came close to getting that part himself, except he had already committed to taking part in Tim Burton's adaptation of The Planet of the Apes. Tom Felton, who was Draco Malfoy in the film, was cast after an interesting event. Felton hadn't read any of the books before auditioning for the part. In the audition, the kids were asked which was their favorite part of the novel. When it was Tom's turn, he mentioned the Gringotts scene, just like the previous candidate had. Columbus found his cunning behavior hilarious and immediately offered him the part. For the protagonist trio, things were a bit more difficult. Thousands of British kids attended the open casting, which consisted of three parts. 
First, they had to read a page of the novel out loud, then improvise the scene of the arrival at Hogwarts, and finally read a couple of pages from the script under the keen eye of Columbus. Sometimes, he'd make them act scenes from young Sherlock Holmes, a script he'd written himself. The search for the young wizards was long and exhaustive, and it wore out everyone involved. In the case of Hermione's role, a casting team visited several local primary schools trying to find the right girl. That way, they got to Emma Watson's school near Oxford, and at first, she refused to audition. It was her drama teacher who convinced and encouraged her. Rowling liked and supported her from the first time she saw her audition. Rupert Grint was already a fan of the books. When he read about casting on a magazine, he recorded himself rapping about how much he'd love to play the role of Ron. The team was so amused by that, they arranged an interview, and that's how he became part of the cast. As expected, the leading role was a tough one. Columbus wanted Daniel Radcliffe from the beginning, but his parents weren't happy with the idea, partly because of the fame and media exposure their son would get at such an early age, and partly because the shooting was meant to be in the States and take six months. Liam Aiken was the next candidate, but the offer didn't last long because he was not actually British. Half a year in, Figgis left the production because she was tired of the seemingly never-ending casting process and Columbus's stubbornness regarding Harry's role. Things took a turn for the better when Heyman and Clovis bumped into Radcliffe and his father at the cinema. They started talking, and they managed to convince the father, promising the shooting would be in the United Kingdom. The initial contract would only be for two years, and they would protect him from the media. To avoid any issues with the parents of the other casting members, the producers made sure all actors and actresses of school age received classes during the shoot. Originally, the crew didn't want to have any physical differences between the characters' book descriptions and the actors' physical appearances. For instance, Daniel Radcliffe's eyes are blue, so he would wear green contact lenses. However, he was allergic to them, so they had to drop that idea. Emma Watson was meant to wear fake teeth to match Hermione's large front teeth, but she had trouble speaking, so they had to drop that idea as well. To be able to shoot in the United Kingdom, the local industry helped looking for locations and offered Warner the Leavitson Studios, an airbase used during World War II that was turned into a huge production studio. The enormous hangars were perfect for the building of sets and interiors, despite having some leakage and not being soundproof. Another favor Warner was granted by the British government were small changes in labor laws for child actors, which strictly limited the working hours. A few extra hours per day and more flexible flexibility regarding classes on set made everything easier. Filming began on September 29, 2000 and ended on March 23, 2001. Besides shooting in the studios, other locations were used, like Alnwick Castle, Gloucester Cathedral, and Oxford University's Library and Faculty of Theology. The London Zoo was used for the scene with the snake, and King's Cross Station is where students board the train to get to Hogwarts. In the meantime, the experienced composer John Williams started working on the soundtrack. His work was based around music Let motifs for characters and settings, two for Hogwarts, one for Diagon Alley, one for Quidditch, two for Voldemort, and the main theme, known as the Hedwig theme, which became iconic for the saga. Post-production was rushed and special effects didn't meet the director's expectations. Warner had set a release date that was way too soon. Neither Columbus nor the technical team were satisfied with the result, although it wasn't bad at all. The quantity and complexity of Harry Potter's post-production boosted the visual effects market in the United Kingdom. Eventually, the Harry Potter films would make the local industry grow enormously. For certain particular complex scenes, help from the United States was required, but from the second film onwards, the British crew took care of everything. So much so that other countries nowadays turn to them for special effects. Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone was an absolute success, breaking the record previously held by Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace, and making $900 million worldwide and 66 million pounds in the United Kingdom. The amazing response from the audience and critics made way for the following.